So it is now my pleasure to tell you two things. There will actually be a reception for those of you who are here after this uh, concluding talk. Uh, so please, uh, that's an incentive for you to stay. But we're coming to the end of the day, and it's my pleasure to, to invite uh, Tammy Bellamy to provide the last keynote speech for the day. Uh, Tammy is a senior project engineer for Water Services uh, Regional uh, Municipality of Waterloo. Uh, and she's uh, for the wastewater program within the Water Services Division of the Region of Waterloo. Her primary role is administering the region's contract with the Ontario Clean Water Agency, often referred to as OQA, uh, to operate and maintain the wastewater treatment and pumping facilities. Uh, Tammy has been with the region for seven years, and during that time has successfully led the Water Services Energy Savings Program and played a key role in the development and execution of the, the corporate energy plan. She has great experience with innovative and collaborative projects to reduce energy consumption. Prior to joining the region of Waterloo, Tani spent 12 years as an environmental engineer in the auto sector, uh, leading programs related to air, waste, and wastewater treatment, as well as managing an extensive ISO 1401 uh, environmental management system. She is a licensed professional engineer in Ontario with a Bachelor of Science degree in engineering uh, from the University of Guelph. Uh, Tammy, please. Good afternoon. So I'm going to now take you down into the world of wastewater treatment and how uh, collaboration uh, within the region has led to our success of our energy program in wastewater treatment. So at the region of Waterloo, we have some core values. And these values are the guiding principles of how we do our work. One of the core values, um, we are committed to building internal and external relationships to achieve common goals and to resolve challenges that we're faced with. Collaboration is a key value um, that we need to uh, foster and use every day to have success of our energy program. And we've realize significant energy savings through this collaborative effort. For wet water and wastewater services, the involvement of key stakeholders, both internal and external, has been um, integral in the identification, prioritization, and implementation of energy initiatives and projects that we've uh, carried out. Um, from different design groups, we've got an engineering planning group, we've got design and construction, we have our operations group, which is I am part of, we have our asset management group, and then externally, we've worked very closely with our local distribution companies as well to identify projects um, um, uh, for energy efficiency. We have a corporate energy plan and the plan sets out our strategy and actions to build on past successes and improve energy performance um, through a structured approach. Recognizing that collaboration is crucial in the success of our energy program, one of the guiding principles of the plan focuses on interdepartmental and stakeholder engagement. Without that, it's, it's really difficult then to rise above the challenges of, of bringing a, a project from the conception all the way to implementation. So when you look at our energy breakdown, you can see um, the wastewater operations or treatment and pumping um, accounts for about 32% of the region's total electricity consumption. And this is due uh, to process equipment, pumping, and treatment requirements that are unique to wastewater operations. The region owns 13 wastewater treatment plants and seven pumping stations. And you can see in this um, diagram, we've got our three largest plants, 
is our Kitchener Wastewater Treatment Plant, our Waterloo Wastewater Treatment Plant, and our Galt Wastewater Treatment Plant. Um, and the processing capacity of those is greater than 50 megaliters uh, per day. So the Ontario Clean Water Agency, or Aqua as you may know them, is contracted to operate and maintain and manage our wastewater facilities. So the region, we own the facilities, but we contract this third party to come in with their expertise to operate and maintain our facilities. Um, so they look after our 13 wastewater treatment plants, our seven pumping stations, and we also own uh, two of the rural wastewater collection systems. So the collection of the wastewater that then takes it to the facilities for treatment. And that's in the townships of North Dumfries and Wellesley. Um, as part of the Engineering and Wastewater Programs Group, my role is to oversee Aqua and work with them, monitor their performance um, while we treat about 180,000 cubic meters of wastewater every day. And the amount of wastewater we treat every day is about equivalent to 72 Olympic-sized swimming pools, just to put it in perspective. So from a wastewater perspective, our electrical consumption, um, you can see by this graph, we've increased over the past five years by about 26%. Um, it is anticipated that we will continue to increase our consumption as we continue to implement the recommendations of our master plans. So that would include upgrading our facilities, upgrading the infrastructure, um, expanding some of our treatment capacity for growth and things like that. Historically, our electrical costs have continued to increase dramatically as can be seen in this graph from 2014 to 2016. Um, it was about a 43% increase in cost of electricity. In 2017, the region's large wastewater treatment plants were eligible or became eligible to participate in Ontario's Industrial Conservation Initiative or ICI program, which resulted in a slight de decrease in cost from 2016 to 2018 and we continue to see a slight decrease in that cost. So the Industrial Conservation Initiative is a form of demand response that allows us to achieve cost savings by reducing demands during Ontario's peak periods. So under this program, the global adjustment, which we've already learned about today, um, so under this program with our participation, we get charged global adjustment based on our percentage contribution to the top five peak uh, Ontario demand hours, okay? Rather than the fixed rate that we were um, charged with before. So in this particular example of one of our large wastewater treatment plants, I think this might be the, our Waterloo plant, um, global adjustment used to up, so Month to month, our total invoiced amount changes depending on how much we're using month to month. But if you look at just the total invoice, back in 2016, global adjustment accounted for 68% of our bill. Okay, not, not what we use in energy, that's just that global adjustment. That's quite a hard, large percentage. Since participation in this project program, um, and for uh, having an opportunity then during those five peak periods, to curb our demand, um, therefore shaving off those Ontario peaks uh, that all these Class A customers do, um, we can now see a decrease in what our portion of global adjustment that we're paying. Um, so in 2018, the, that piece of the, the invoice was decreased down to 57%, and our total invoiced amount has continued to decrease as a result of this decrease in global adjustment payments. When we look at the electricity distribution um, of our wastewater treatment plants, like I said, we have 13 of them. You can see our three largest ones right there. We've got Kitchener Wastewater Treatment Plant at 31%, um, Waterloo at 25%, and Galt at 20%, and that's in line with their capacity size as well. So Kitchener is number one, Waterloo's number two, Galt's number three in terms of capacity. Um, 
So basically, our three largest facilities account for 76% of our total uh, energy consumed, or total electricity consumed. Our Kitchener Wastewater Treatment Plant, as I said, is the largest facility that we own, and we treat about 68 megaliters per day, and it accounts for, like I said, 31% of um, what's consumed by all of our wastewater treatment facilities. So this is a picture of our Kitchener plant. Our Kitchener plant is a conventional activated sludge process, and it's treated effluent discharges into the Grand River. Major process upgrades that were necessary to improve the river quality um, and plant reliability began in 2008, and construction of those plans are continuing into 2020 and beyond. So you can just imagine, as I'm going through the rest of my slides, 2008, we kind of embarked on this whole process upgrade. So the technology that was available then has certainly changed to what it is now. Um, so just keep that in mind as we go through um, some of the things that we're doing there. And to minimize the impact of the expected increases in chemical, or sorry, electrical consumption, we engage key stakeholders really early in the design phase of the project um, to ensure that we looked at energy efficiency and that that was incorporated in all the aspects of the upgrades and the facility design, as it was back in, in 2008. So first uh, example, we'll look at upgrades in our secondary treatment process. So our secondary treatment is a biological process. It uses bacteria to consume suspended solids and dissolved organic materials in the wastewater. Um, it's in the aeration process where dissolved oxygen is provided by mechanical means uh, to the bacteria to make them happy and want to treat and stabilize the wastewater. Um, this process typically, or traditionally, accounts for about 60 to 70 percent of the total energy consumed at a wastewater treatment plant, a typical one like this one. So working collaboratively together, the project team investigated several design options that would improve treatment performance as well as minimize the energy use in the aeration process. Again, the, the energy used is coming from the mechanical means, such as blowers, that provide the dissolved oxygen to the basins themselves. So in option one uh, was to design an anoxic, or without oxygen, selector zone um, at the beginning of the aeration basins to promote denitrification. So when ammonia in the wastewater is consumed, nitrogen is converted to nitrates. In this zone, the nitrifying bacteria thrive as they are capable of using the oxygen from the nitrates to break down the organic matter that's present in the wastewater, okay? Because in this zone, we're not supplying any mechanical air. So this oxygen credit, um, we can say, allows the size of the aeration system and associated energy consumption to be reduced. We don't need to provide mechanical air into this zone, and yet we're still able to efficiently and effectively treat, treat the wastewater, um, making a suitable environment for nitrifying bacteria to thrive. It also improves the sludge settability, which is another benefit of, of having an anoxic zone, um, and that will re further reduce pumping requirements um, and therefore associated energy requirements. Second option uh, was the installation. So once we get past the anoxic zone, then you have your aerated zones where we're providing the dissolved oxygen through blowers. Um, so option two was to install high turbo speed blowers, high speed, sorry, turbo blowers, with automatic dissolved oxygen feedback to supply and control the air that's provided into these basins. So high speed turbo blowers operate, they operate at a much higher efficiency than traditional um, um, positive displacement blowers, um, thereby reducing the overall energy requirements of the aeration process. And then having the feedback, so we know how much um, air we want to supply for the bacteria to be happy and thrive. Um, so we're constantly 
with instrumentation, taking measurements of that air, sending it back through the feedback loop so that the blowers are only supplying the amount of air that we require or, or have set, um, and thereby reducing the amount of energy there as well. And as we, of course, um, every day, technology is improving, instrumentation is improving, blowers are improving. So, you know, at the time, this was kind of where we were at. Now we're investigating other options then to take it further to further improve the energy efficiency within those aeration system. Next, we'll look at ter tertiary treatment process. And tertiary treatment is the final cleaning process that removes uh, waste, um, sorry, that improves the wastewater quality before it's discharged to the environment. The tertiary filters remove suspended solids um, and nutrients like phosphorus uh, that can be carried over from the secondary treatment process. So in this case, uh, the project team narrowed down the design to two filter options. The first option was the, the traditional option. This is what typically you have a conventional activated sludge plant, you're typically gonna put in these deep bed fil filters, okay? The second option that they decided to look at, um, that we pushed to look at was a relatively new technology and it involves cloth media disc filters. So since so. The reason we pushed for the second alternative is because we also know that with the traditional deep bed filter technology, there's a high head loss across the deep bed filters. So an intermediate pumping station would be required um, to provide the driving head across these filters. Whereas when we looked at the disc filter technology, it offered a low head uh, loss across the entire system. So this, along with some other design enhancements that we collaboratively developed with the vendor as well as the project team, allows for gravity flow through the filters, thereby eliminating the need for intermediate pumping through the system. So again, this translates into energy savings, or in this case, I would say energy avoidance because we're kind of building into and upgrading a plant. And next process I'll talk about is digestion. Okay, so Tej touched on it a little bit in, in the last panel discussion, but basically digestion, we've got settled solids from the wastewater treatment plant, uh, from the wastewater treatment process, we separate the clean water and then we have the solids that we pulled out of it, or the sludge, um, and that gets processed through anaerobic digesters. So a fraction of the organic material is converted into biogas, um, while the remainder is dried and becomes a soil-like material referred to as biosolids. So in this example, we, lo we'll, uh, we looked specifically at the digester mixing system, where the preliminary design, uh, way back in 2000 and, I don't know, prior to 2008, um, called for the installation of a, of a conventional hydraulic mixing system. You know, it's robust, it's been proven, and, you know, typically that's what's used in these systems. Um, so, given the magnitude of this infrastructural renewal project in Kitchener and for the region of Waterloo, we basically took a value engineering approach um, with the project team. Basically, a value, value engineering exercise is just simply a systematic approach to evaluate your options and identify uh, alternatives to improve the value of the project and associated processes. So, of course, when you're doing this exercise, collaboration is key. You gotta think outside of the box. You're trying to come up with different ideas to try and find what are those, those alternatives that we can turn to to increase the value of the project. So the project team proposed uh, a new energy efficient alternative when it came to digester mixing, and that was with the linear motion mixing system. Linear motion mixers, um, uh, linear motion mixers feature an innovative design, uh, innovatively engineered internal cam design, which helps transmit the energy from the drive motor to the sludge really efficiently. So the linear motion mixers, if, um, the efficiency of them allows the use of smaller motors 
thereby significantly reducing the annual electrical usage and operating costs of the system. So basically, it's like a plunger. You can see in the picture, it just basically uh, plunges and then creates the mixing through kind of turbulence and eddies. And then finally, our largest energy savings project within the region's uh, wastewater treatment facilities is the in introduction of cogeneration. So the region is in the construction phase right now of installing combined heat and power gas engines at each of its three largest wastewater treatment plants, including the Kitchener wastewater treatment plant, and then of course the Galt and the Waterloo wastewater treatment plants. These engines will be fueled by the biogas, which is the byproduct containing methane that is produced from the anaerobic digestion process. These new engines will, be, will produce both electricity and heat at the same time. The electricity will be used uh, to provide behind the meter power to our treatment processes. Um, and the heat generated from the engines will then be used to preheat the sludge that's going into the digester. So currently, the biogas that we generate from our anaerobic digestions um, some of it is used to heat our hot water boilers, and which then goes to heating some of our processes as well as some of our buildings. But there's more biogas that's being generated than what we can use and reclaim in that process. So oftentimes, uh, we need to flare off any excess biogas. So this is a great way of taking all of that biogas then, feeding it into the uh, cogeneration engines and generating electricity and heat. Um, so the biogas produced at Kitchener Wastewater Treatment Plant will be enough to uh, run an 800 kilowatt engine, thereby reducing our consumption there by about 60 percent from the from the grid, um, or about 5,000 megawatts per year, and that's about the amount of energy uh, used on average by about 500 houses a year. So collaboration with both internal and external stakeholders was essential to bring us into uh, this current construction phase of the project and meet our objectives of producing a sustainable form of green energy, thereby reducing our reliance on conventional power and allows us to generate electricity at a lower cost um, than the power from the local utility. So just in closing, Innovation through collaboration has led to the success of our energy saving program at the region of Waterloo and water services. And this approach will continue to drive our program further. We're coming off, coming to the end of a period of high intensive infra infrastructural renewal um, and upgrades at many of our facilities. So the next decade, We'll be looking at new technologies that'll help us um, refine our process, optimize our process. There's a lot of opportunities within our treatment processes to optimize how we run them, run them more efficiently, which will then translate into energy savings as well. Because now we have all this new equipment. We've got um, new processes that we have to learn. And so once we start to dial those in, we'll also see an inherent energy reduction. And then we'll continue to partner with different um, technologies, uh, vendors to trial um, new instrumentation for maybe ammonia control, based control uh, processing and things like that, which we're already looking at to try and continue to improve our, our energy reduction. But we can't do it alone and we need um, uh, the key driver for us or the key approach that has been really successful is just collaboration and having all of those minds together thinking outside of the box and thinking of new um, alternatives to traditional means of, of processing. Because we have the existing infrastructure, it's conventional. So we need to start thinking about how we can bring other treatment technologies in to help us uh, move forward and maybe minimize how much we have to expand in the future by using the existing infrastructure that we already have. And that's it. Thank you. A question in case. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tammy, for uh, a good comprehensive summary of uh, actually very innovative and thoughtful approaches you're taking to managing the wastewater uh, here. Uh, 
uh, thank you for your patience in staying. I'm wondering if there are any questions from the audience for Tammy. Well, it looks like you made a very clear <laughs> presentation. Uh, and that brings me to, in essence, the conclusion of uh, today. Uh, thanks again for your patience. I'd like to remind you there's a small reception. Uh, please stick around. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, before we end, I would certainly like to acknowledge the great contribution that the Institute staff uh, make in putting these events together, Armagan al Haka in particular, and and uh, Erin and Jessica Strickler and, and other staff at WISE. So thank you for all your help. Uh, I do the least amount of work uh, when it comes to putting this event together. Uh, so uh, stick around for the reception if you have the time. Uh, but again, thank you for attending. And uh, we will keep you apprised of uh, new developments. I believe if you were a registrant, you would be able to see all the presentations on the website. Uh, in, a, in a few days. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon. Bye.